One of the most exciting things about uh, the microfinance world is that it basically touches on all different kinds of people. You'll have um, people in the urban settings who do very ordinary jobs, people in the villages, in the rural areas who are farmers, and then uh, now the session we're having this afternoon that is about uh, refugees. But before I introduce uh, uh, the panelists, the gentleman who will be leading us this afternoon, I want, as, as the guys move down, the organizers of this conference brought together a very rich panel of people and uh, participants. Each time somebody would stand up to make a question or comment, je suis le DG, je suis le PDG, je suis le... There is no one who is not important in here. And all important people are used to signing. So I want all of you to stand up. The effects of a good lunch before they start kicking into us. Yes, everybody stand up. Now, I want you to make your signature with your head. Now, I want you to put both of your hands in front and make your signature with both of your hands. Now, I want you to hold your waist and make your signature with your waist. Yes, that food has gone down. You may now sit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the first time in the last two days, I'm introducing a personal friend of mine. Uh, he's been working with the Business Development Fund of Rwanda for several years. He has more than 14 years experience in dealing with medium and small uh, enterprises, especially around development finance. He's currently the project program lead at MasterCard Foundation Rwanda, where he works with different partners to develop and deploy affordable and accessible finance to medium and small uh, enterprises. Uh, Livingstone will see, uh, kindly take the floor, and then Livingstone will take over from here and introduce uh, the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. I'll try my best to fit into the shoes of Charles Abba. He's been a champion into this industry for quite some time. Uh, as I said, my name is definitely Kus Livingston. I'm the program lead uh, MSME Finance at MasterCard Foundation. Today, we're going to add a very important topic dear to us, which is looking at uh, making the most vulnerable segment, uh, segment of our community access finance, all financially included. You will recall with me that the world is having almost around 82.4 million refugees as per, as per UNHCR statistics. But what is most unfortunate is that each year uh, those refugees produce around one million kids without their parents having a sustainable income or anything to depend on to give their kids a future. What is also interesting is that among the 82 million point four, it's only 285,000 that managed to get back to their home country. So where is the rest of the population? It stays in uh, refugee communities, it stays in depressed uh, camps. And you will also recall that worldwide, the biggest contributors of refugees, I think you can know that there is Syria is among the biggest. Venezuela, Afghanistan, in Africa here, South Sudan, and then Myanmar. Which country that hosts most refugees? I think it's Turkey 
as by UNHCR. In East Africa here, we have our neighbor, Uganda, hosting around 1.5 refugees. Those are interesting numbers. So how do we turn that around to make almost 82 million people be accepted in the communities and have a living, be part of the countries they have learned to for refugee? Today, we are honored to have most of the wonderful institutions that work day to day to ensure that these refugees are financially included with innovative financing. On the panel, we have a panel of rich, experienced, and experts that have been working to ensure that refugees get at least start an income, being included with their host communities. Let me take this opportunity to introduce my panel today. Let me start with Fripp Gisudi, is from Credit Aricol. Fripp has worked with the French Development NGO for several years, served the children, including among other institutions, and he has been in different countries, including Rwanda, India, and the Philippines, working there. He's he has designed a number of programs that see refugee communities included. Fripp holds the master's degree in urban social development from the University of Every and an MBA from European University of San Francisco. The profile is long, but I will stop there to in invite others. Fripp, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next on the panel is Thompson Scarfield. He's the in country and regional expert with Opportunity International, based in Uganda. Thompson Scarfield has designed and worked in different countries to help grassroots movements, financial organizations, and also supporting relief efforts in Somalia, Uganda, and other countries. Our current portf uh, portfolio include refugee financial inclusion to promote development of self reliant Uganda has been her own base. Welcome with me, Tamsin, on the platform. Oh, thank you. I'm kind of trying to balance the gender. <laughs> John Wirahira works with Access to Finance Rwanda, where he's in charge of research and knowledge management. He's an economist by profession. He has designed and worked on programs that are intentionally making access to finance to rural poor, refugees included. John is responsible for designing and overseeing the financial sector and market research at Access to Finance Rwanda. John, you are welcome to the platform. <laughs> Lastly, our strong lady is from UNCDF Rwanda, Rosalyn Hoamaol. Rosalyn is a program specialist, country read, UNCDF. has been working with the financial sector for quite some time, developing and leading uh, development within the United Nations Capital Development Fund, implementing inclusive digital economy, leaving no one behind in this digital era. That would be interesting to hear. Jocelyn, you're most welcome. As you have seen, we have a very inclusive panel from all the sectors of this world, and which is very, uh, which is, it's very touching that, that they are involved in ensuring there is access to finance to the most vulnerable communities. I think there is no better person to start with, like Thompson Scarfield who is living in a country in, that is hosting the biggest number of refugees in East Africa, actually in Africa, mm. next to Turkey. 1.5 million refugees. How are you guys doing that at Opportunity Uganda? Mm. Please tell us. I mean, we're, 
we're doing a small part of a very big puzzle, as you said, 1.5 million refugees. Um, when we started in this space back in 2018, everybody was very skeptical. And when I say everybody, I mean I work with Opportunity International. We're a global microfinance organization. Um, and we partner with Opportunity Bank Uganda and Finca in Uganda. And we didn't fully appreciate the, the potential for refugee financing. And, and you ask us, how did we do it? The initial entry point was just going to the settlements themselves, talking to the refugees, and seen the business potential. The first time I went, I took the CEO of the bank, Tine Mawatcha at the time, and we were both surprised, impressed, taken aback by what we saw in terms of businesses, in terms of livelihood opportunities. There were border borders, there were marketplaces, people had stores, shops, and I think, you know, Tine's eyes, he's a visionary, lit up, and he said, we can do this. Um, so I think that that entry point was really important just to get buy-in from the bank um, and for all of us to understand that this was a viable segment in terms of financial inclusion. That's great. That's great. Uh, you do understand that, of course, this is a very uh, vulnerable segment mm -hmm. and trusting them with money sometimes is not easy. That's why they are excluded by the normal and traditional financing mechanism. Uh, would you please take us through how you deploying the financial services to this segment? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, vulnerable, absolutely, 100%. It's a humanitarian context. At the same time, there are many refugees, and even the word refugee itself is quite loaded, right? What do we think of when we think of a refugee? Who do we think of in terms of dependency, um, in terms of terms of need, and when you go to the settlements and you talk with individuals, my first conversation in Kiriandongo settlement was with a, he was a pastor, he was a, a pastor, he was also a former civil servant for the South Sudanese government. Um, he was good in IT and he spoke five languages, which is four more than me. And I was taken aback. Um, and he had a small bakery where he lived with his wife and children in the settlement, and they were rearing chickens. So this guy had a lot going on for him. Um, and so just, just to say, you know, you say vulnerable, absolutely, he's vulnerable. At the same time, this is a man who had had businesses, who had worked for the government, who spoke languages, and who was creating business opportunities for himself where he was. So all of that to say, segmentation is really critical. Um, we, we had the help of PHB, it's a digital catalyzer, and I, and I have to mention um, Swiss Capacity Fund, they, they, they paid for that work to be done to help us to segment the refugees uh, into different groups. Um, and, and in brief, we had three broad categories. We had the humanitarian category. These are people who had recently arrived, who were fully dependent, on humanitarian aid, and whose primary needs were around food, shelter, nutrition, um, and, and medical support. Then we moved into the subsistence category, mm. and these were people who had been uh, saving, starting to save, starting to think about business opportunities, starting to think about integration into the communities where they lived, um, and had some small maybe some small businesses going on the side. Then finally, we would look to the resilient category. And these mm. are refugees who've been in country for you know, more than three to five years. They have businesses, they have financial needs, they have desire for loans to expand their businesses, to pay for school fees for their children. Um, and this was the category initially that we saw as our entry point. So that's not to say that um, you know, refugees aren't vulnerable, but just to appreciate who are these refugees and where are the opportunities for, for some of them, like like that pastor that I told yeah. you about. Yeah, yeah, that's very quite interesting and very touching. Uh, I'll, I'll be getting back to you uh, shortly. Uh, I've got to understand that uh, I think Fripp, you'll agree with me. Uh, from Fripp is from Credit uh, uh, Agricole, and. Uh, uh, they lend money to microfinance, which, which lends to the refugee community. How are you managing to take on that risk? Uh, 
<laughs> considering that most of these financial institutions see that community as uh, not being part of the local uh, population. Um, I would say we don't take risk because there is no risk. <laughs> no, I just want to say this because it's true that the perception is that uh, this population is much riskier compared to uh, normal uh, clientele. Um, and especially there's this fear of the flight risk, meaning to say that, I mean, these people will live, so if you provide them with a loan, I mean, um, then they will go back to their country or they will uh, immigrate to the States or Europe and so on. And the figures you shared with us, I mean, uh, Livingstone is, is really clear. I mean, the number of people that really are going back home or that are uh, living is extremely, um, ex is minimum. It's, it's very small numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, the duration of the people, unfortunately, in the settlement camps is between 10 to 20 years. And uh, if you think about Uganda, I mean, I visited settlements where people were there for, for more than 20 years. So um, this is, it was extremely hard for us when we wanted to, to work on this area because we think that, uh, I said it this morning already, that we believe that it's, it's one of the late border of microfinance, how we are able to reach people that are um, uh, more excluded somehow. And when I was talking, I, I didn't get the chance to talk with people from Opportunity, but when I was talking with other um, uh, CEOs of MFIs uh, about the project we had to support them to work in the, in the, in the camp, sometimes I was feeling like talking to bankers. You know, I, mean, I say, guys, I mean, you are here to, to, you talk about microfinance, you talk to get access to uh, finance for socially excluded people. And the first thing that you say when we talk about lending to refugees is, no, guys, we won't do it. It's too risky. Or, mm -hmm. or please provide us with a Definitely. portfolio risk a guarantee. That's just what we want to know and so on. And experience has proven that, I mean, risk is there. It's everywhere, but it's not riskier. I mean, the, the, the capacity of repayment from the refugees is the same or even better, and we do have experiences where it's better than, uh, than the people. So that's why I, I think that um, we have no problem to go into that. I mean, uh, we, we had problem to convince uh, organization to work in that field and to provide the services. But believe me, once they are convinced, when they start to do their work, I mean, I, I remember I had to go to uh, the board meetings of uh, one of our partners in, uh, in Uganda, and they were very skeptical. Now, if we talk to them about it, I mean, they say, oh, it's one of our best portfolio. So uh, I think it's, um, it's a whole process to change the mind on the mm -hmm. way we look at them and to, to recognize that, I mean, refugees have a very high potential of entrepreneurship. I mean, it's people that you can trust. It's people that if you give them the opportunity to do things and to get access to finance, they will not forget about it. Yeah. And that's a long-term relationship that you can build with them. Thank you so much. And uh, there are distinguished participants. When we talk about uh, investing in refugees, uh, Credit Agricole is not investing small. Uh, if I'm to pull out some figures uh, on their refugee program, they did $7.1 million to Vision Finance, Uganda. Brack, Uganda, they did $40 million US dollar. And Yugaford, $8 million US dollar. When are you coming to Rwanda? We have a very huge re refugee community. <laughs> Is there any plans to expand this beyond Uganda? Uh, <clears throat> we're trying right now, we do have some discussion with uh, partners in Zambia and potentially also in Rwanda, mm. because we know that there's, uh, there are opportunities. Uh, and it's clear that, I mean, it's, um, again, as I said, it's, it's more the, um, the, and I had this discussion because we have this program with the uh, UNHCR and, uh, and the SIDA, the Swedish International Development Agency. Mm. And um, for Zambia, for example, I mean, UNHCR, because they asked me to share the experience we had in Uganda. So we had one of our partners in, in, in Zambia. And, and uh, so we had this discussion, this talk, it was fine. And then I said, the only way for you to convince the people is to bring them to the camp yeah. and make them realize 
what we are talking about. Yes. And what we are talking about is exactly what you say. I mean, we're talking about people that have ideas. We are talking about people that have projects. Mm. We are talking about people that have a vision. They want to save. They want to send their children to the, to the school and so on. And uh, so the UNESCOM brought this, um, our partners to the camp. And then they came back and said, yes, we have to go for it. They had to convince the board to make them sure that it would be work properly. And so now we're just starting, so I hope that's good. But if you go there, I mean, and I remember I was with my colleague when we go to the camp, and I, I remember when I was there in, um, in the north of Uganda, in, um, uh, in uh, Moyo and so on, and I was visiting and I had this strong feeling to say, if I'm doing this job, it's for that. You feel so convinced that that's why we are here. I mean, yeah. to help this, uh, these people. Um, sometimes when you go to visit people, I mean, you, you feel that, okay, it's fine. I mean, they do the business, it's fine. But here, I mean, you really see that you can make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fripp. And, and I think I'll come back to you later, and uh, Tamsi, on, on how, uh, how is the repayment uh, modalities uh, and also recovery rate when it comes to financing refugees. The institution you're financing, are they recovering some of this money? How is the success rate? I think I'll, I'll be coming back to you later. Let me go direct to Rosalind. Uh, because UNCDF has amazing programs. And uh, what is interesting is that you guys are also deploying digital solutions to reach out to the refugee communities. So, uh, I will start, I start with the digital platforms that you have built, uh, then start with the digital platform and also tell us about the financial inclusion, how you're deploying them. Thank you. Thank you, Livingstone. Uh, I'll start by saying, have you ever tried to digitize people and you found out that they have SIM cards instead of phones? <laughs> <laughs> that was the journey of UNCDF when we started. To say, to compliment no, what? No, I don't think the audience heard that. <laughs> yeah, uh, please, I want you to repeat that. <laughs> I was saying, have you ever tried to digitize people? And because you are convinced that in this era, people are digitalized, you find that they have SIM cards instead of phones. So how do you address that? So that's a question for all of us. Yeah. And that's the situation that you should start by looking at. So before we even talk about digital literacy or mm. financial inclusion, I would like to compliment to what Tamsin or Philip have said. I think when we talk about refugees, we, we have blended them, but then we should try to create proper profile of these mm. people. Mm -hmm. As Tamsin has said, if we put them into segments, we have people who are well-educated, who used to have businesses, who used to have shops, who used to have activities. And you have others who didn't have anything. So when you put them together in one basket, definitely it becomes a little bit challenging to give them services mm. and to become like a, a business profile for the financial institutions. But I think in terms of financial inclusion, there's need to profile these people. Mm -hmm. Who are they? Where are they coming from? What have they been doing? What are they currently doing? Uh, case in point is that one of our partners, when they went to Mahama camp, they found that the transactions that were happening in Mahama camps were much, much bigger than what was happening in the host communities, which shows them that these are potential clients that we need to serve. But now the question is, how do we serve them? Mm -hmm. What do we do with them? And that's how UNCDF come up with the digital approach. Fortunately, or unfortunately, if I may say, the project was launched during the COVID pandemic, yeah. creating the need that, is, that was needed by then to have these people using the digital aspect to have these people having funds to receive the trainings. And it was quite challenging. That's why I started by saying, what do you do when people have SIM cards and they don't have funds? 
yet they need to use it. Mm. So those are the kind of different challenges that were there, and we managed to give 400 funds as UNCDF so that we start with the training. Of course, with 400 funds, when you are talking about in total camps of more than 200,000 refugees, it's little, it's, it's tiny. Yeah. But creating that interest, like Philip said, it was very key. To show them you need to be digitally educated, you need to have these digital skills, then you need to be financially accessible so that you expand on your businesses and what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And also thanks to the government of Rwanda, because the government of Rwanda has come up together with UNHCR with a program of giving land to these refugees where they can go and cultivate and have some incomes. Because you can't give financial services, they can't be business case if they don't have an income stream. And how do you create that income stream? Mm. So all these questions are the ones that we tried to really address bit by bit, but with an intention of creating market awareness to say, these are the population, there is a potential with these ones, let's try and see what we can do. The government of Rwanda has started by giving them land, they are creating revenues, but now FSPs, can you come in? Mm. Who are they? How do we profile them? But we also look at the component of youth. Majority of them are becoming youth. We have refugees in Gihembe camp that have been there for more than 20 years. They have given birth, the children have grown, they have finished primary, secondary school. Now what do you do? They need to be employed. Otherwise, they are going to the same cycle that they have been going through. So all these questions are the questions that UNCDF Rwanda have been trying to address. Yeah, I'll say that in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, I think that's also another element. I mean, I think it's to ensure that all, even policymakers look at that segment as people who can really make things move. If you say that there were transactions in camps even more than the host communities, nearby communities. That means there is, could be business taking place in those camps. So looking at your saving groups, uh, you tried to mobilize and, and, uh, and coordinate around 569 saving groups. Uh, what, is, what are the intentions of those saving groups? I think uh, I talked about the profiling mm. aspect. And one of the things that we were trying to see was how do we group them in communities so that when it's one by one individual, it's easily to give up. But when they are together in savings group, they mm. give hands to each other. Yeah. So with our partners, we created them into savings group. And eventually what we wanted was to really improve in with them moving away from the paper-based transaction and the ledger book and digitize their operations. Yes. So that with that, they start creating data. Because at the end of the day, we need data. Mm. Financial institution needs data to know how to access them. So when we digitize those 5,000 groups, was an approach to see these are the people. They have come together. They meet every week. They save this much. They are doing this. With all this available data, what can you do? And I think we are happy to say that it has been successful because up to today we have more than 3,000 groups that received loans oh. from Equity and Mutanguha Finance, which was very amazing. Of course, we are talking of micro loans, but it's a start to show that if they, are, they come together, they give hands to each other, then you have visibility on their data, it can create something. So that was the approach we wanted yeah. to use. Uh, I think I'll be coming back to you uh, on either using those saving groups, are you able also to mobilize them to offer them business development services, um, income generating activities? And of course, it's good you mentioned about uh, using the saving groups to attract funding from even the traditional financing mechanism like uh, banks and especially equity bank. Um, maybe let me pose this uh, to John, because uh, John is from Access to Finance Rwanda, and Access to Finance Rwanda is trying to make sure that every person in Rwanda is financially included. So 
in your policies, your programs, are there programs that are intentionally directed at uh, making the refugee communities and actually even the host communities uh, financially inclu included within the financial sector? I'll say th th thank you very much for uh, that question. Um, actually, we implemented over the past two years uh, one of the uh, projects that targeted uh, refugees, but also the host community. Uh, it was one of the pilot projects that we implemented, of course, uh, as, as, as a pilot, but also um, paving ways for additional uh, projects to come as we have them uh, in a, an our current strategy. Um, that project was initiated in response to the UN um, uh, resolution for economic inclusion uh, of refugees, mm -hmm. but also it matches with the national strategy for uh, economic inclusion that is e both implemented by the government of Rwanda but also the U uh, UNHCR for integrating uh, economically the refugees. So, and uh, I, I saw you like numbers. We have more than uh, 140,000 refugees. They're actually yeah. more, more than that, of course. And uh, um, uh, the, 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 of course, it also coincides with the period where uh, the, uh, we didn't have enough resources, I think, for, to meet the needs of uh, our refugees. Mm. So that project was initiated as a um, pilot project to try to ensure that uh, 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 refugees, but also the host community, are financially included. Um, that project, our implementation approach, of course, as AFR, we don't impl implement directly, but we, we do engage other, uh, other, other partners in implementation of that project. So we worked with uh, uh, one of the um, uh, local microfinance uh, institution that helped uh, implementing that, and we've seen the CEO um, you know, in the panel for one of the previous sessions, uh, it's called Mutanguha. But also, uh, prior to that, uh, the, the main role of that uh, local um, uh, microfinance institution was to uh, not only test the ideas, uh, collect information, but also develop and roll out the products that is uh, more um, appropriate to the needs of the refugees and the host communities. Um, but also, it had, the project also had the component of capacity building. So that is training uh, refugees and host communities on financial management, but also business development, so that whenever they access those funds, they are able to really um, invest them in profitable income generating activities. So, um, but also we benefited from other technical support from uh, uh, the University of uh, um, uh, Frankfurt uh, School of uh, uh, finance that helped uh, us on that. So the good thing is that uh, you'd see that, uh, as others uh, said, refi refugees are like other communities. Definitely. They are really economically active and uh, can take loans, repay effectively as any other uh, client. Mm -hmm. So um, we were happy to see that some of the achievements of that project, uh, pilot project, we had uh, about 8,000 uh, accounts opened mm -hmm. through that uh, um, uh, facility, but also we had like 1,000 refugees taking loans and repaying effectively. So uh, it was quite very uh, insightful and giving a message that, oh, these are not necessarily the, the, the ones that we think have the risk, but rather uh, uh, they're like any other clients, and then we should capitalize on the, uh, and build their capacity to more engage economically in order to build their resilience. Yeah, yeah, thank you, John. I don't know whether we have people from uh, financial institutions in the audience, but this, uh, what we are hearing here is that refugee communities are not just there for handouts. These are people who live and stay in the communities like any, anybody else. And they pay well their loans. So uh, maybe, John, before I go to the audience, 
uh, I want to know, how do you manage to involve a financial institution uh, like Mutangu and bring them on board? You make them understand that they are not going into a risk business. <laughs> Actually, they are going to lend to people who have uh, a project, people who have been organized and need to uh, cut out that project. Our approach is engaging all the stakeholders from uh, the start. So um, we not only engaged the, uh, the uh, Umutangu has the one of the local uh, microfinance, but also engaged other stakeholders, including the, the government through the Minister of uh, um, uh, Emergency Management, but also the UN, uh, uh, the UNHCR, but also with regard to implementation, we we we, we called. Uh, microfinance institution or even financial institution who were willing to support us in the implementation of that uh, project. Mm. So uh, we went through a bidding process and uh, of course there was some money that we injected into that. Uh, we, we actually used uh, around um, 350, uh, 370,000 uh, USD that uh, were given uh, to facilitate the process. So um, uh, the successful uh, financial institution that uh, met the requirement that were set uh, mm -hmm. was uh, Umutanguha. So we, throughout the process, we went, uh, uh, we were together, we accompanied them uh, with the technical support that I talked about. So um, it was quite a very a, a educating experience that we all went through because it, that was the first time that we were going into a refugee and, and host communities. So. Um, it, w it was that process that we went through, procurement, but also uh, supporting them technically and ensuring that they're delivering what is required uh, yeah. uh, by, uh, by, by refugees and host communities. Thank you so much, John. Uh, before I pose another uh, uh, set of questions to panelists, I want to give an opportunity to one uh, participant to pose a question. Just one question. We'll have another time for a set of questions to the panelist, but I need to, I need to just give an opportunity, uh, just an interval question uh, from the audience. If there is any question, just one, that can't wait. Yes, yes. Uh, someone help me with the microphone. And they... Thank you. Uh, my name is Corinne Riquet from SIGAP. Just a quick question about um, the fact that uh, refugees may not have an ID to uh, open an account, and I, I would like to know if, uh, how, in your experience, you overcome this uh, potential constraint, if it is. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think uh, who is willing to answer that because the. Co the fact that refugees, actually, I think I would direct it to Rose, <laughs> Rose, <laughs> Rose Lynn. Uh, you, you talked about IDs, you talked about uh, not having even phones, but having SIM cards. Yes, how are you handling such a component of? Uh, I'll answer that by saying that Rwanda is a bit advanced compared to other countries, mm -hmm. whereby uh, the Ministry of Emergency Management in partnership with UNHCR have been giving IDs to refugees. Of course, it has not yet been rolled into all the camps. You have some camps where they have IDs, mm. and you have other camps where they still use <laughs> the national identification code. So now the process, which was a bit challenging, mm. is that some financial institution will accept the national identification card, mm. but others will not accept it. So uh, by the time AFR, I was at AFR, <laughs> we, had, we had a discussion <laughs> with the good. central bank to see how they can accommodate that because there's a system in the central bank where they, there's a specific number, digit numbers that have to be filled in and yet the, the national, the card it has more numbers than the IDs. Mm. So it was a challenge and they had to waiver that for a specific period waiting for the ministry and UNHCR to roll out card. So that has been challenging, but uh, I think with the ones that already received IDs and more to come, that will be solved, but that has been challenging indeed. 
Yeah, that's quite good. I think Philip could have a, a complimentary answer on that. Yes, I would definitely confirm that it's a, it's a real issue. Uh, in where we work in Uganda, uh, again, I think it depends a lot, as you mentioned, about the global context in terms of what is the policy from the government, what is the, the way they, they, they want to facilitate the integration of the refugees. And it's true that Rwanda and certainly Uganda is among the, I would say, the best countries. We've, we study, uh, we wanted to do something in Jordan, for example, it was much more, uh, much more complex to, do, uh, to work there. But um, what was interesting in Uganda, for example, is that it's true that a lot of them don't have the proper documentation, but um, with, with the government it was possible, and in Uganda you work through the office of the prime ministers, where, and through the support of the UNHCR we were able to, uh, that most of the clients have an ID that is accepted, uh, for uh, by the by the bank and by the institution, but I just wanted to mention that because you talk about the SIM cards, and one of the big problem we had, I mean our partners had in um, in Uganda, is where they went wanted to go from mobile uh, uh, banking and using the SIM cards, and then they had a problem with the uh, with the companies. So the problem was not with um, with the central bank or with um, uh, they could do it, but with a, a company that they were not accepting the um, refugees' IDs for uh, delivering the SIM card. So it was a big problem. It, there was a lot of discussion back and forth with the... And that's where you have to work in partnership. That's where you have to work with the UNHCR, you have to work with the government, you have to work with the different NGOs to make it understand that, okay, it still is possible. The problem has been solved, but it took us, I think, more than six months or seven months before uh, they were able to use the, um, the mobile money and just use the, the, the SIM card. Yeah, uh, I think that answers your question. Your question. And uh, at the same time, I would do for a uh, follow up question because uh, before we went to, to Rosalina John, you had a, a standing question on uh, how is the portfolio performing? Uh, for you. Um, very good. Uh, no, frankly speaking, it was performing extremely well before the COVID, zero hmm. uh, percent wow. uh, portfolio at risk. I think that I don't have to define here what is a portfolio at risk. It was zero percent, um, extremely good repayment. Um, the COVID, especially in Uganda, has been really tough. I mean, they had a lot of, uh, they have locked down. I mean, so it's one of the countries that has been the most, uh, that faced most of the problem. So currently, um, the portfolio is around six to 7%, which is quite good. I mean, it's, uh, if you think about uh, what we have seen in other places. What was extremely interesting is that it's better compared to, for our partners, their, their, um, their other client. So the, the portfolio at risk for the refugees is, much, is performing much better compared to the other one. Why? Because, um, uh, because I think it, uh, one thing that we've, they have done, I mean, they, and I think it's one of the key success if you want to work with uh, serving refugees people is to employ refugees as loan officers. They know how to speak the language, they know how the cultures, Mm. They live in the settlement, mm. Mm. so they have this proximity. And it's true that because they were working with loan officers that were in the, um, in the settlement, it was pretty easy for them to go there, um, even during the, the COVID crisis, to meet uh, with the people. Of course, group was not possible, but at least they could have this direct interconnection and so on. And, and I remember the discussion with some uh, loan officer refugees, and they were so proud to mm. have a full contract, to be fully employed, because it is usually as refugees, it's really hard to get a contract. It's really yeah. hard to have a, to be fully employed by any any organization, and so they were so proud. I mean, it, it was just amazing, and and they do an excellent job, excellent job. Yeah, actually not doing badly because six point five percent and so on. We have people here who are not even. In refugee communities, we are, <laughs> which are eating 15% and then performing loans. And it is very interesting. And I think that's also break the barrier. It breaks the barrier of understanding that these are organized people who are in the same communities, who, who sell and trade with each other. And I think also trading with the community. And uh, this 
that brings me to a question which I'm going to pose to Tamsin. Uh, of course, you complement that with also with the, uh, how, the, how your portfolio is doing, but at the same time, how is the acceptance of the host community with the refugee community? Do you see an embracement, an integration? Do you see them doing business together? Sure. Um, I think, yeah, just to add on to the numbers, because I think this is really important, as you mm. say, um, during the first lockdown in Uganda, the portfolio at risk for both of our partners didn't change at all, and it was better performing for the refugees than for the non-refugees, mm. and refugees continue to save. And I think that's largely because of the culture of, uh, of saving groups, whereas a lot of the non-refugees were not. So mm. that was quite an interesting point. Secondly, um, just to give people a sense of people's capacity to save, of refugees' capacity to save, currently with our two partners we have, and I've got the numbers here, uh, 1,432 individual accounts and 155 group accounts. Mm. And between them, they've got over $1 million been mm. saved. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So just to say, these are people who are actively saving. Um, and yeah, the numbers are surprising. In, yeah. In terms of the integration with the host, I mean, I know more about Uganda than the rest of the world, but I, you know, in Uganda, everything that we do, the government mandate is to target 70% refugees, 30% host community. So uh, the financial services that we deliver, the training that we deliver, the guarantee fund that we have in place, which has been put in place to encourage the bank to lend to that group, and again, has not been used, just to mm. add that point. We've had three, three people that passed away, and that was the only time a loan has been written off. Yeah. So again, it gives you a sense of the, the performance. Um, but all of those services are as available to the host as to the refugees. Um, so one of the challenges or one of the areas of interest to us, which has been a bit of a pivot, I would say, um, now that we've got our partners delivering financial services, uh, now that we have agreements with OPM and partnerships with the likes of UNHCR and other NGOs and the refugee organizations themselves, is to look at how we can uh, drive more market linkages, uh, more su sustainable livelihood solutions um, and job creation. And this is a new area for us, um, but I mention that because integration with the host community is going to be critical for that in terms of driving market linkages. Definitely. Um, and so the idea would be to benefit both the refugees and the host as well. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting to see that um, refugees within their communities, within their camp, can be able to save a million dollars. Hmm. Very interesting. How do you do that? I mean, just one minute. To encourage saving. Uh, I mean, I can share a trick of the trade. <laughs> There's a lot of people <laughs> in the room. But um, one of the, you know, I think someone mentioned it this morning in a talk. Everything we do here, we're talking about inclusive finance. And what that means is, yeah, we need to serve the vulnerable communities. Yes, we need to have a social mission on how we, how we achieve that and who are we targeting. But we also, we're working with commercial banks. And they need to be sustainable and they need to make money. Um, and so we've been exploring partnerships with um, organizations, NGOs, um, who are, have cash grants. Um, and who are working to drive sustainable livelihood solutions for the refugees. And I, and I would say, not very well, according to the latest um, uh, Livelihood Working Group report, which came out of Uganda, which says currently NGOs are achieving 1% to 2% of their livelihood targets in the country in terms of sustainable job creation. It's a really hard nut to crack. Um, and so working with NGOs um, to uh, identify ways that we can partner with them on, on, on cash grants, um, on deposits that they are giving to the refugees themselves. Additionally, before we had those partnerships in place, there were a lot of refugees that were just saving and wanted a secure and safe place to save. That's good. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, I think you have to have a conversation with Rosalyn on the digital platform for savings. I mean, they're doing good with Save, IVR, and uh, also... Uh, within a few minutes, we remain with to uh, call on the participants to ask some questions. Um, uh, Rosalyn and uh, John, uh, especially uh, Rosalyn, about the business development services you're offering, trainings, and that leads to savings and so on. 
could you take us through just a few, just for like one, two minutes? Uh, actually, because our intervention was looking at really including the digital aspect, we developed a digital application called Lenga, and we'll soon be launching it that was providing digital and financial skills. Mm. We partnered with our partners, we bought tablets, so that now instead of having normal classrooms, we have classrooms where they are going through the application. So the application was really customer tailed so that they have section where they are training them on the digital skills, the normal ones, keyboard, calculators, how to say yes, the green button, the red button, but at the same time having a financial component, a financial aspect of it on how do you save? Mm. How do you make a budget? How do you make a plan? Actually, those questions, when I was looking at the app, that even sometimes ask ourselves, we don't do and we don't apply. <laughs> so, and it was quite successful because at the end of each lesson, there's a quiz that they can go home and play about it and try to figure out themselves, what if I want to buy like a motorcycle and it cost 100,000, how much should I be saving? Mm -hmm. What should I change? If I take one beer per week and I cut off from one beer per week and I do one beer per month, how much will I be able to save? So it was more interactive to show them like real case scenarios of what can you do to achieve a specific thing. But in the sense that, yes, this is the plan you have. You might not be having this amount, like what they have been saying, Philip and Thompson, but now how do you approach a financial institution? Definitely. Which one do you select? What do you look at? And all those questions have, have really been the one that triggered them to open their account, but also to have access to those loans. Yeah. And it's good to see that you're developing a culture uh, for the refugee communities to save, to actually make sacrifices over savings, uh, which is uh, lacking even in the host communities and so on. If I'm to sacrifice my beer to <laughs> from, a, from a week to a month, <laughs> that's something which is difficult in a normal life. Uh, so, uh, Jonah, I need you to, uh, to make this simple for, because access to finance Rwanda, you create and develop products and so on. Uh, do you see a situation where the, the organization that are investing in refugee communities Fiji businesses can have a product that can de risk uh, their finance that they deploy? I think my response would be yes. Hmm. And uh, in our new strategy, we are uh, trying to help financial institutions to really. Um, by designing some of the intervention that would de-risk mm. um, uh, the, the financial institution willing to uh, participate in, in, in financing the, um, the refugee and host communities. Mm. So we, we've met in our new strategy um, uh, a priority to target those people that we think uh, are excluded by the current market, current interventions. Those include, of course, refugee and host communities, but also other uh, marginalized groups such as women, youth, uh, people with disability, and so on. So uh, what we are doing is to, uh, we are doing diagnosis, uh, market assessments, mm. that would highlight the key challenges and the issues that we have in the market. Mm. So highlighting the challenges that are limiting the financial institutions um, uh, into venturing to, uh, in, in, in reaching those uh, targeted groups. Mm. But also, on top of that, we intend to also design some specific projects, some uh, specific interventions, and facilitate as a, as, a, as a market catalyzer to ensure, incentivize them to really go to uh, refugee and host communities. So these are some of the interventions that we have, and uh, uh, 
uh, we are still at the start of, uh, of our strategy, but uh, I think in coming days we'll be having some of the tangible intervention towards uh, these communities. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. I think it's now time to, to open the discussion to our audience. I'm sure the panel has made some significant submission, interventions, and the programs that are very interesting uh, and dear to us. Uh, I'm opening uh, the floor. I think we're going to have some questions. Uh, let's start from the other corner, from a very isolated gentleman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Livingston. Um, my name is Claude. I work for AC, AC in Homoko. Um, my, it's more of, um, I do have um, a compliment and two questions. Uh, one compliment is on the uh, refugee investment. So we've been working with refugees uh, over the past five years. We've been working in all camps in Rwanda and camps in Kenya, and uh, we are now expanding to Ethiopia camp. So, uh, it's just to echo what Philip and, uh, and colleague uh, from Opportunity. Trans me, yeah. Uh, from Opportunity uh, on Refugee Investment. Um, and uh, we've been doing this work and uh, uh, we've been experiencing a good repayment. And uh, as of now, our current portfolio standards, refugee portfolio standards are almost $1 million. And uh, the, repayment, the repayment rate is, uh, for Rwanda, it's uh, almost 97% for Kenya for Kenya, it's 98%. And they actually, we've, refugees has been demonstrating a good repayment even compared to the host communities uh, borrowers. Uh, my, my question is, uh, I don't know who's going to answer my question, if it's uh, Access Finance Rwanda or uh, maybe someone from UNHCR. We still have very few players uh, in the refugee space, especially in Rwanda and uh, I've been even seeing the same in Kenya and even Ethiopia. Very few financial institutions. For instance, in Rwanda, I may even say that we are only two financial institutions uh, giving uh, investment in, uh, in the camps. Um, and my question is uh, how, how can either access to financial uh, UNHL or other partners can actually make advocacy and have more players coming into refugee space yeah. uh, investment. Um, secondly, is there, um, I know it's uh, maybe, it's a challenge maybe in the microfinance uh, area. Our current uh, cost of loan is, is, is a real bit higher, especially in the microfinance sector. Uh, and uh, maybe Livingston, I don't know if you have the current data on the annual percentage rates, but uh, I'm skeptical that it might be even more than 20% in this market. Mm. And how can we maybe uh, make advocacy on this and uh, have a very low cost investment uh, in this refugee space since we are dealing with uh, a vulnerable population or yeah. even either bringing in some uh, branded finance in this space. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Claude. Yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll get back to your questions later. Uh, the lady there in, in the middle. I think I'll take two more from her. Uh, two more questions. Who else? Okay. This circle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Hanadi. I think I'm the elephant in the room because I'm from UNHCR. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the financial inclusion officer and I'm based in Nairobi. Uh, thank you for your question. Your question is important and Corinne's questions <laughs> is also very important. I just want to say thank you for all the panelists and it's just a comment on the role of UNHCR. What we like to see on financial services for refugees is not access to finance is actually sustainable access to finance. It's very important. 
because we do not want to see projects that come and work in certain places and they're not anchored at the country level and then the project ends, as we all know, and the refugees are left without anything. This mm -hmm. is even worse than not having access in the first place. So when we talk about access to finance, we would like to talk about sustainability as well, sustainable access to finance. And this mm -hmm. is where the role of microfinance institution becomes really, really important because they're there and they're there for the long term. So what we try to do in the camps, and you are right, there are a lot, a lot of initiatives in the camp. What we're trying to do is to make partnerships complementary and not conflicting or repetitive. And we do it through, you know, uh, working groups. We do it through uh, introducing partners to each other. We don't have to be involved in the program at all. We don't have to do anything ourselves, but we would like to facilitate the contacts and we would like to facilitate complementarity between partners. Yeah. So to everybody who's here, please be in contact with us whenever you want. We are ready to help. We are ready to help in any way we can. On the ID side, uh, it's a problem, of course, uh, and you can also segment refugees in countries, especially in Africa, in some places, they have nothing. They have only the UNHCR refugee card. And in these conditions, what we, what we resort to is mostly uh, informal type of financial services in the beginning. Um, in more advanced countries like Uganda, like Rwanda, we can go into more complex uh, products. But what we always do with governments is advocate, advocate, advocate to make things better. So that's also a role of UNHCR to advocate with governments. And we would like to work with all partners. Anybody who wants to work with us on the advocacy side, we are open for that. Thanks. Thank you, Anad. Next, the lady. Uh, can I make it brief? You can speak with the mask on. <laughs> uh, bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Mariama. Je travaille avec uh, le Bureau international du travail. En Mauritanie, uh, il y a une assistance technique qui se fait dans le cadre des projets du BIT uh, avec les institutions de microfinance. Et il y a une partie uh, pour uh, le travail avec les réfugiés. Maintenant, uh, quand on veut mettre en, en place des... Um, justement des crédits qui sont destinés aux réfugiés. Euh, on a la, la, la première chose qui est justement l'identification euh, de ces personnes. Euh, et euh, bon, on a, on a essayé, vous avez essayé un peu de répondre à la question. Mais il y a la deuxième chose qui est liée à l'assurance de ces emprunteurs. Donc, même si les institutions de microfinance acceptent de, de financer les réfugiés, il y a la partie assurance. Qui, qui peut ne pas être en phase justement avec ce dispositif de KYC et qui demande à ce qu'on ait des papiers d'identification nationale ou des numéros d'identification nationale, ce qui n'est pas le cas de tous les réfugiés euh, quand on voit des numéros avec euh, des, des lettres qui ne rentrent pas dans la base de données. Maintenant, euh, moi j'aimerais savoir avec les expériences du Rwanda, comment est-ce que vous avez surmonté ce, cette épreuve euh, au Rwanda ou en Ouganda Voilà, merci. Thank you, thank you. Uh, which institution? Uh, I know. Oh, I know. That's good. Uh, thank you. Bonjour à tous. Philippe Brum, PHV. J'avais une question courte sur l'innovation des services financiers pour euh, la résilience des réfugiés. On parle d'accès, d'épargne, de crédit. Je n'ai pas entendu beaucoup d'innovation. Mais je me suis peut-être trompé. Merci. Thank you so much. I think, uh, as of now, we'll let our colleagues answer the four questions. And um, I'm sure also they will be able to clarify what is innovative about <laughs> the interventions. But of course, uh, they submitted a lot of innovative financing mechanism and financing vehicles. Um, I think 
uh, the question from Claude. Uh, uh, I will direct it to Fripp, uh, because I had also mentioned it before. Few prayers in Rwanda. You have the money. Are uh, you joining the market? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I see it's, it's a real issue. I mean, you re, as, as I said at the beginning, I mean, uh, I fully agree. I mean, people have, we have to convince uh, FSP to do something. And I think the best way is by this type of conference. We did organize with the UNHCR on Monday uh, a training session on, on the subject. Uh, we had around 30, uh, 30 participants. Um, I'm, um, each time I can get the opportunity to talk about this subject, uh, we try to do it, and our uh, foundation, we try to do it. So I think it's by, we, we, before starting the pro, the, our project, we, we did some research study to understand what was the, the, the market and so on. Uh, it has been published. Uh, so I think that what is very important is to keep talking about it, to keep showing that it works, and the experience we have today from um, opportunity, from access to finance, the work that is done by the UNCDF and so on, I think is there to really try to convince the people. But it's a long way. Um, I think that more and more organizations start to, to understand that there is, uh, that it's, um, I would say, I, I don't like the term because I think it's a little bit commercial and, and I don't like to look at people that way, but it's a market. It's a real potential market mm -hmm. for the institution. And what we want to advocate is that they can be served in the mainstream. I mean, that working for the refugee doesn't need to have specific product, specific services. You might need to adapt. There is the question of the KYC and so on. But you can serve them like you serve the other clientele. And maybe, and because you talk about the innovation, um, I think that uh, somehow I would agree that that's innovation in the sense that, I mean, is to change the mindset of the people. It to change the, the way you look at things, and that's innovation. Innovation is not just technology. Innovation is not just doing things. Um, I think that the fact that these people are not served because there's a lot of wrong ideas, a lot of wrong perception about who they are, the way they work, mm -hmm. if we are able to make, change our paradigm to them, I feel very comfortable to say, yes, that's innovation. Yeah. We, we do have innovation on mobile things. We do, as I explained to you in our, uh, with the VSLA, we try to include this. But I mean, at this stage, unfortunately, because people are not served, innovation is to go there. Innovation is to take the risk. Innovation is to dare to do something with them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> dare to do, take the risk. Uh, I think now the other questions, I'm going to direct them to Rosary and Tamsin uh, on sustainable financing. Are you guys financing just for today or you financing, making interventions that are going to see these guys grow their businesses, be able to sustain their families, and they are financing, creating a ripple effects within their livelihoods? Uh, starting with you, Tamsin. Uh, Mind you, we remaining with a few minutes, and I have to take a few questions from this side, which has been magnetized. <laughs> so. Okay, so I need to be quick, but um, in terms of innovation, to add on to what Philippe said, it's innovative to be in the settlement in and of itself. Now the linkage of the humanitarian sector within a market systems approach is very innovative. Yeah. Um, I can also talk a lot about digital technology and the innovations our banks are doing in terms of light KYC, um, uh, remote loan onboarding, remote loan origination, sorry, field-based tablets. But that's a whole other discussion. We can go into that. It, it, but it's, it's hugely innovative. In terms of um, sustainability, I think for us as a financial, working with financial institutions, we have to be sustainable, otherwise, why are we there? Um, Opportunity Bank last month opened a branch in Naka Valley, a fully fledged physical branch in the settlement. Why? Because they see the potential. Mm. You can't tell me they're not thinking about sustainability, having invested that type of money. Mm. Um, uh, uh, the job of, of, of Opportunity is to help 
similar to UNHCR, but on a tiny scale, in terms of the linkages, the partnerships, the business training, uh, to be able to drive more inclusive financial and sustainable solutions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello, Zrimpri. Uh, thank you. Uh, I like the fact that the question came from UNHCR, <laughs> because you can't say of financial inclusion if the humanitarian side is not supporting. Yeah. So wherever there is financial inclusion or financial services that are being offered, there will be a need to have UNHCR that has been on the ground for quite some time to really even them, I liked what Philip said that innovation is having the mind changing, but to also see mind changing from the side of the humanitarian side because there's a, a tendency of keeping the humanitarian side, but also wanting the financial inclusion to happen while this gap is still happening. So I think for the sustainability to be really there, there's need to close the gap between the inclusion and the humanitarian so that both actors are working together. Et si je peux répondre à la personne de Mauritanie, vous avez parlé par rapport à l'identification, est-ce qu'il faut se faire? Je pense qu'il faut commencer par rapport aux régulateurs. Au Rwanda, ça a réussi parce que on avait travaillé avec la Banque centrale. Une fois que la Banque centrale, une fois que le gouvernement comprend l'importance de pouvoir aider les réfugiés et de les inclure dans leur secteur financier, c'est plus facile parce que là, ils prennent des stratégies et des approches pour pouvoir les aider. Mais tu ne peux pas aller au, au niveau micro et commencer à faire l'implémentation sans avoir l'accès ou, ou l'environnement qui favorise ça. Donc, il faut commencer au niveau des régulateurs, du gouvernement et puis descendre en bas par rapport à l'implémentation. Merci, merci. C'est François Petit. <laughs> uh, John, let me get back to you. Uh, I think this is what also we discussed, the risking. Uh, the lady has been asking the insurance of um, uh, funding and so on. I think you had the question right. right? So, please. Thank you very much. Uh, on the issue of risk, but I think before talking to that, I would add also um, something on the, on the question that was asked by somebody from uh, Ingomoko. Claude from Ingomoko. Yeah. Mm. Uh, coming from Ingomoko, it means that uh, he is also aware of one of the projects uh, that is currently being implemented by the World Bank here uh, called Jambere, mm. which is uh, also targeting uh, refugees and host communities. So I think it's a sign uh, that uh, we, of course, it's a, it's a long process, but we still we already we started seeing people coming in, um, uh, being aware. The government is aware. Other partners are aware of the on the need of uh, uh, engaging with uh, refugees and host communities. So on the issue of uh, insurance, as you said, I, I think uh, uh, the, it's also linked to the question that uh, has been uh, responded to by Rosalind on the uh, identification. Of course, we have the regulatory framework in place, and uh, um, advocates also are, um, are being uh, taken to the n another level in order to ensure that uh, um, uh, refugees are taken into consideration in terms of identification, because some of the study would uh, mean that, uh, have shown that uh, most refugees uh, are excluded from uh, employment opportunities, especially in the formal sector, w because of uh, the issue of identification. So I think for, for the case of insu ins insurance, some of the, the, the uh, diagnosis study that we're doing now uh, will highlight some of these issues. And AFR will be happy, of course, in partnership with other partners, uh, other uh, collaborators to ensure that uh, uh, the key challenges that are coming in are also interventions that are designed in order to risk um, the, the, the sectors. So I think there will be some incentives that will be designed. I can't say currently which ones, but based on the findings that uh, we, we, we will come from those that diagnosis market assessment that we are conducting, we'll be able to uh, design appropriate in, a, intervention that will help uh, actors to really go into um, uh, the sector without uh, any fee. Thank you so much. Uh, let me take a few questions from this side. That's uh, three of them, uh, but very brief questions, so that we remaining on raise uh, like 10 minutes. So, yes, sir. Please, someone with a microphone. 
Someone with the microphone? Uh, after that, gentlemen, anyone else? Anyone with a question this side? Okay. Okay. Moi, c'est Victor. Donc, euh, je travaille pour ADA au Niger. Je voulais une petite comparaison de ce qu'on vient d'entendre tout de suite pour euh, Ouganda et Rwanda avec euh, la, la zone du Sahel, Burkina, Mali, Niger. Et là-bas, on parle beaucoup plus de réfugiés internes. Non, ou du, du moins de déplacés internes. D'abord, et donc pour voir comment on peut organiser l'inclusion financière dans ces trois zones-là. Parce que la particularité que je vois, c'est déplacer et attendre plutôt de repartir chez eux. Ils veulent que les États sécurisent leur village d'origine pour qu'ils puissent repartir. Alors qu'ici, on voit qu'il y a des réfugiés qui ont plus de 10-15 ans. Donc, comment on peut organiser l'offre de services dans de tels contextes Merci. Thank you. Merci. Moi, c'est Damien. Je représente Erin, une institution de microfinance locale. Beaucoup de mes inquiétudes ont été et ont trouvé des réponses à travers les questions qui ont été posées. Mais j'ai encore un souci pour la désignation des produits. La conception des produits et dans ce secteur des réfugiés. C'est bon qu'on eh, puisse eh, permettre à ce, cette population d'accéder aux services financiers, mais eh, je ne sais pas si on peut eh, planifier les le, le, le produits à donner à, à, ce, à, à, à cette population-là, compte tenu de leur instabilité, et surtout que tout ne dépend pas d'eux, tout ne dépend pas de la population d'accueil. Il y a toute une institution organisée pour réprimer le système de réfugiés. Et donc, à chaque décision, il peut y avoir un conflit au niveau du produit qui a été conçu, au niveau des services qui ont été rendus en matière de, 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 de services financiers. Je ne sais pas si je me suis fait comprendre. Oh. Yes, yes. I definitely understand your question. And, uh, uh, okay, I'll take your question, but uh, allow me to, to move away uh, from my panel for that question. Address it to uh, Anand from UNCR. Please, you're going to answer that question. The certain <laughs> ensuring that refugees uh, uh, stay. Okay. They, tend to get back to their uh, host countries, and then financial institutions are supposed to invest. So, UNC, <laughs> you are the right person to answer that. I will save you the button on that. So, <laughs> we'll get back to that. Uh, gentlemen, you may, you, may, you may ask your question. Okay, merci. Moi, c'est Monsieur Jean-Claude. Je suis le directeur des opérations d'une institution de microfinance de la RDC. Bon, je voudrais juste compléter par rapport à l'intervention de, de, notre, de notre collègue. En fait, pour ce qui a trait à l'inclusion financière des, des réfugiés, moi je pense qu'il serait mieux de commencer par l'amont. Parce que si nous disons que nous pouvons concevoir des produits euh, euh, à destination des, des réfugiés sans pour autant effectuer au préalable une étude du marché, ça serait vraiment une manière de nous tromper. Donc nous devons d'abord commencer par effectuer l'étude du marché euh, dans ces milieux-là pour essayer de comprendre c'est quoi leurs réels besoins en interrogeant par exemple sur les sources des revenus actuels, euh, par exemple s'ils ont besoin des, des crédits, et quelles sont les activités qu'ils réalisent et, et actuellement, où est-ce qu'ils ont trouvé des revenus pour financer leurs activités actuellement. Donc il y a toute une panoplie de questions que nous pouvons poser pour, et pour identifier les réels besoins. Et c'est sur base de ces besoins que nous pouvons mettre sur pied des produits adaptés effectivement à leurs besoins. Bon, là, je fais allusion à une difficulté à laquelle nous étions RT lorsqu'il était question pour nous d'émettre des produits à destination des étudiants. 
il y avait tout un tas de questions qu'on s'est posées. On doutait aussi de la stabilité des étudiants. On doutait aussi de leurs sources de revenus et de leur capacité à pouvoir épargner. Mais après avoir effectué l'étude de marché, nous avons compris que c'était vraiment un segment rentable. Et jusqu'au jour d'aujourd'hui, nous y travaillons et nous avons même l'accompagnement des UNCDF dans ces secteurs-là. Merci. <laughs> Thank you so much. Those were great questions. And uh, are we going to do like this? We're going to answer the question to the audience and then at the same time make our conclusive remarks. So, one minute each as you respond and you conclude. I'll start with John because uh, we the question looked at market studies and you guys have been good at that, the last questions. So I will start with you as you answer that question and at the same time make your conclusive remarks about the today. Thank you. I think the gentleman from DRC is, is totally right. And that's exactly what we're doing as access to finance. We, if you saw in our ad, but I think we've, uh, uh, we've got a number of uh, market uh, assessment uh, going on. So the fact is that to generate not everything that is observable can be seen as the only challenge that is hindering uh, refugees or host communities to access finances. So it's very important that we also dig deep and really come up with uh, uh, the real issues that uh, might hinder the incentives of, uh, for the financial sector to, to for the finance institution to engage with the uh, uh, communities and, host, uh, uh, and refugees, but also uh, inform in the design of appropriate uh, interventions. So that's very key for us. And uh, uh, of course, this is happening at the beginning of our phase, uh, but uh, I think uh, in a couple of months, we'll be having uh, tangible findings, uh, the key issues on the market and the incentives that are required and intervention will be designed in order to uh, ensure that uh, we've provided adequate evidence for everything, a decision to be made. Thank you. Thank you, John. Rosalind. Uh, if you may allow, I will first respond to the gentleman who mm. asked about internal refugees. Mm. Je crois que dans votre situation, le cas est plus simple parce que là, par rapport à l'Ouganda ou au Rwanda, on parle de réfugiés qui viennent de loin et on n'est pas sûr qu'ils vont rester pendant longtemps. C'est vrai qu'ils viennent de faire 10 ans ou 20 ans, mais ils doivent rentrer à un certain moment. Par contre, chez vous, ce sont des réfugiés qui sont dans le pays et qui sont toujours dans leur propre pays. Donc l'idée, c'est de faire le profilage de leur identité, de connaître qui ils sont et de pouvoir leur offrir des services qui, idéalement, même s'ils rentrent dans leur ville, vous pouvez les suivre. Donc, une solution digitale pourra bien répondre à votre question. As a, my conclusion to that, I will say that we need synergy. It's true, we are seeing great interest in terms of having financial inclusion in the refugee space, but each player is doing its own work. So there will be need to have synergies among the players on the market so that the intervention is sustainable, as UNHCR had mentioned, but there's deeper and we are addressing key issues that are raising. If I'm having an intervention, AFR is having an intervention, Credit Agricole is having one. If we can pull our resources together and our forces together, I think we can have an impactful uh, intervention in their refugee camps. Thank you. Thank you. Fripp. Pour répondre à la question sur à la fois les produits et à la fois sur les, les déplacés, euh, je dirais que effectivement, je pense que la, la problématique des déplacés, elle est, elle est quand même assez nouvelle. Et j'ai été très, excusez-moi, voilà, j'espère qu'il ne va pas rappeler. Euh, et par exemple, j'étais assez surpris quand on a fait cette formation avec le HCR euh, lundi. Euh, il y avait beaucoup de gens du Burkina Faso et pour qui c'était vraiment un, un vrai problème parce que c'est des choses nouvelles et on n'est pas, pas préparé, on ne sait pas toujours comment faire et là je crois qu'encore il faut, euh, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec vous comme quoi effectivement euh, l'approche est un, un peu différente que le, le, le mobile banking ou, ou les, les solutions digitales vont permettre de suivre, de suivre davantage et je crois qu'il me paraît important, c'est la capacité que l'on a effectivement à être 
euh, avoir quand même toujours la volonté de, de, de les servir et de travailler avec eux. Parce qu'au final, ce que vous dites sur la, la personne de la RDC, c'est qu'effectivement, et nous on, est, on milite beaucoup pour dire que il faut avoir la même approche que quand vous voulez travailler avec n'importe quel type de nouveau client. Et dans ce que vous dites, on fait une étude, et ça c'est vrai, il faut faire une étude. Et les produits, moi je dis toujours, les produits, ils sont déjà là en général. Il n'y a pas besoin de faire des choses révolutionnaires, il ne faut pas se prendre la tête. Les produits sont là, il faut simplement qu'ils soient disponibles. Il faut simplement qu'ils soient... Et une fois qu'ils seront disponibles, ils vont se rendre compte que les gens vont payer et qu'il n'y aura pas de... Et, et, et qu'il y aura moins de... Euh, et qu'en général, il n'y a, a pas fondamentalement de, 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 de problème. Par contre, ce qui est important, et, et ça c'est peut-être plus sur la problématique avec les réfugiés que les populations déplacées, c'est que, effectivement, les réfugiés, il y a quand même aussi une culture d'avoir été beaucoup dans une approche humanitaire, hein, et donc d'avoir reçu surtout de la subvention. Et là, la question, c'est encore toujours pareil, c'est d'avoir une approche, et ce que disait Anadi du, du HCR, c'est qu'il faut effectivement, euh, là encore, euh, être rentré dans une nouvelle dynamique qui est de pérenniser la structure et de faire en sorte que les, les, les réfugiés eux-mêmes comprennent qu'ils rentrent dans une nouvelle dynamique qui n'est pas simplement d'attendre qu'on leur euh, donne des, 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 des subventions. Et ça, on se rend compte qu'au final, une fois qu'on fait confiance aux gens, euh, bah, ils comprennent très bien et qu'ils s'inscrivent tout à fait dans cette... Euh, dans cette dynamique là et je voudrais moi juste pour conclure parce qu'il y avait cette question de, de, du risque de, de, de départ j'étais dans un camp dans, dans le nord de, de l'Ouganda et je disais aux gens et alors qu'est-ce qui se passe si vous rentrez un jour au sud soudan et, et les femmes qui étaient là et que vous avez un prix avec, avec l'institution et ils disaient mais euh, non non nous on, on vous remboursera avant de partir parce que vous nous avez aidé quand, quand, quand on est, vous étiez là quand on avait besoin de vous et, et on doit être redevable de, de ça je ne sais pas si elles le feront mais en tout cas elles ont spontanément euh, dit qu'elles euh, elles voulaient euh, ben finalement rendre ce qu'elles avaient euh, elles-mêmes euh, elles reçu et moi c'est ce message que j'ai envie de, de partager avec vous hein, c'est qu'il faut faire confiance et euh, pour s'engager Um, it's true, yes, the internally displacement is a big problem in West and Central Africa. I mean, DRC is the biggest, has 5.6 million internally displaced people. Uh, Burkina Faso has 1.5 million internally displaced people, that's true. Um, the problem is easy and more difficult at the same time. Uh, you are right, if people go back to their villages and they are from remote villages, maybe you cannot Uh, you know, immediately identify them. But what we can do is um, I can connect you with my colleagues in West Africa and we can have further discussions on that, on ways to uh, provide financial services for the internally displaced because UNHCR has a lot of data on this mm. and they can track people as well. Uh, we're not saying we're going to track people for you, but we can find a way or a certain partnership whereby you can use uh, part of our systems uh, to work with the internally displaced. This happened in many other countries. It happened in Lebanon, where one microfinance institution used our centers to provide training, not financial services, for refugee populations. So we are open to discuss further uh, on this question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, finally. A lot's been said. Um, I, I think all of the partners here, including Opportunity, did do some kind of market uh, research um, to understand the, the context in which we were operating. I think the proof has been very clearly articulated in the past hour and a half in terms of the viability of this segment for financial services. I think we can learn from one another. And obviously, in new contexts like DRC, there's always a need to, to understand the context specifically. Um, I think my concluding remark would be Someone mentioned the word synergy. Mm. Um, that, that's critical as we continue to move forward and particularly to drive a more market-driven approach, integrating increased livelihood opportunities, market linkages, job creation to really drive the, the sustainability of this group moving forward. Yeah. Thank, thank you. As we look forward for you to resume your business in Rwanda. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, opportunity was here before, so... We're still here. Okay, through our ego. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, we had an amazing uh, 
uh, panel. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. You're doing a great job, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Please, the audience, add more, add more, add more. Mm -hmm. They did a good job, and they continue to do a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're just right on time, yes? Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Livingstone, and uh, the whole panel for a very exciting conversation uh, around uh, uh, refugees and inclusive. Mine is very, very simple. I'm taking you to a coffee break. I have a very important announcement to make. If you're traveling tomorrow or Friday, kindly get your COVID test done. They are going to open only up to 20 to 5. So you have about only 30 minutes. So it's downstairs next to AD09. You will see a clinic there. So that's where it is, downstairs next to AD09. There's a clinic there. It's only open for the next 35 minutes. That's if you're traveling tomorrow or Friday. For those who are still here, they'll be open uh, uh, the whole day tomorrow uh, and so on. So we're going for a coffee break and we'll be back in 30 minutes. See you in 30 minutes. Thank you so much.